This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 284 of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast, our last of 2022. 2022 started off with so much excitement. I, I was really so counting on this year, turning things around. And then then the year happened. Um, but I can't wait for 2023. Joining me for this last episode of the year are Rhett Caseman and Josh Johnson of Inner Voice Brewing out here in Decatur, Georgia. Welcome to the podcast, guys. What's How's up, man? Uh, we're sitting back in the brew house. It was the quietest place we could find, and there's just that beautiful sound of uh, of yeast bubbling away in the background. Um, just fantastic. Uh, but we're going to talk about new, fresh styles. Both of you guys have done rounds of a number of breweries here in the greater Atlanta area. You've got plenty of experience to draw on, and here at Inner Voice, uh, it is there's a, a freshness, there's a aesthetic uh, newness to it. There's a you know, a, a clever artistic bent, and uh, you all are, that is extending from the style and design into the beers itself. So we're going to talk about fresh, hazy beers. We're going to talk about uh, expressing thyles in these things. I, it's like, I just have to put the word thyle in it. <laughs> right, Because if yeah. you say thyle, people automatically want to listen. So <laughs> it's amazing. Is that it's how you absolutely amazing. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't even know half the time, you know. We... I'm drinking a thialized hazy IPA mm-hmm. right now. We're going to talk about brewing, you know, fresh, hazy IPA styles, pale ale styles, uh, all that fun stuff. And we're going to get into this kind of, you know, fun, fresh edge of beer creativity. But first, for nearly 30 years, g and Chillers has set the mark for quality equipment you can rely on. g and stands above the rest as the only chiller manufacturer that engineers your glycol piping for free. g and also stands alone as the only chiller manufacturer with an in-house team of installers and engineers with 30 years of real-world field labor experience in breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Contact the Total Glycol System Design experts today at GD Chillers. Dot com. Also, what if you could take your favorite recipes and make a non-alcoholic version without sacrificing the color, flavor, or beer quality? NA, no problem. The Alchemator from ProBrew uses proprietary membrane technology to strip the alcohol from the beer without sacrificing all the elements like flavor and color that make the beer great. Are you ready to brew like a pro? Check out www.probrew.com to learn more about the Alchemator from ProBrew or shoot them an email at contact us at probrew.com today. Uh, Probrew is a subsidiary of Technoblend, now a Promoc brand. So, Rhett and Josh, I don't know who wants to give me their history first, um, but talk to me about uh, uh, your arc through beer uh, from that craft beer moment uh, through the kind of, uh, you know, commercial, the career arc that led you to get into brewing professionally and then, uh, of course, launching the brewery right here. Yeah. Um, Rhett's so, gonna, Rhett's yeah, gonna take I'll, it first. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so yeah, Josh and I met, um, in 2013 at Monday Night Brewing. Um, he was an intern there and I was a dude that needed a job. And, uh, so, you know, we kind of worked there, um, on the packaging line and, um, you know, Josh did some brewing internship stuff over there. And so, uh, eventually Josh took a job up at Heist. Yeah. So like, we basically just packed boxes yeah, at, yeah. at Monday night for the first sure. you know, year and then uh-huh. worked at Monday night. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's amazing yeah. how many people came out of the packaging side of breweries yeah. or front of house for that matter, yeah. and then got back in a brew house and, uh, you know, and, and got into it for sure. For sure. Yeah, before that, I was I was homebrewing all the time, and that's how yeah. I got the, the job at Monday night. I sent out emails to all the budding breweries in 2013 here in Atlanta. And a, lot, a lot of brewers that I'll talk to you, will tell you, like, mm-hmm. I'd rather have somebody who just wants to work hard and is interested that we can teach rather yeah. than somebody who comes in with bad habits that we've got to fix. Yeah. And it was kind of the, the first boom of craft beer. So there sure, were 2013. Right. You know, they would take anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I was I was homebrewing for like a couple of years. I always yeah. want to be a chef, too, before that. Sure, but, sure. Um, and I, I went to school for hospitality management and I was like, I don't you know, I don't want to work in a. Uh, restaurant. So let me like try and work overnights at a, you know, regional craft. <laughs> sure. Brewery. Sure. Um, but then, yeah, I went up to heist for a little bit and then Monday night 
offered me a job again. So then Rhett and I got reunited and we oh. kind of stayed on the same track from here on. That, yeah, from there on I, out. I'd gotten promoted to the uh, glorious seller from the uh, packaging line. Yeah. And so eventually I got up on the brew house and I was lead brewer over there and Josh was handling um, what R&D. R &D. R &D. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so I did so. pretty much all the R&D at Monday night up until we left. We actually left at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. From we, Monday we, night, we had a. Uh, I, I think we both let them know we were quitting like together. Oh. We were, oh. yeah. It was, it was kind of like a stepbrothers type situation, uh -huh. you know. So, but it, no know. bad blood there. No, yeah, no, no bad blood. No, no. no, no. I, I stayed on working for like another yeah. two months. Yeah, you know. We did a collab with them too recently. Yeah, yeah. Here, so, so you know, we love those good. guys. They're great. But, they, Helped yeah. our career so much, so yeah, and we we just wanted to start. We'll get a podcast done with Monday Night One <laughs> yeah. of these days. In fact, in yeah. full disclosure, this afternoon I was supposed to record one, uh, <laughs> and it just uh, it fell apart at the last minute. Yeah. And you guys have jumped in to, to talk to me about this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. We'll hear their side of the story. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> no, but one of the things I love is just you know how collegial and how you know there's this network of of brewers now running breweries in Georgia who came out of the similar homebrew club, same homebrew club. We're roommates with each other and homebrewed together, um, you know, that works together. And, and, you know, even when you leave and start your own place, there's still this nice connection between folks. Um, and it's just nice to have more good quality beer in Georgia. Part of that, because the laws have been so wonky here for so long mm -hmm. that this kind of brewery couldn't have existed, you know, five years ago. And so, so there is a lot of new tap room opportunity for brewers in the entire state of Georgia and everyone is, you yeah. know, is trying to fill that void and, for it. And that's the beauty of that law change is we're, we're finally seeing a point where brewers can start breweries, you know, career brewers, because it doesn't take that massive capital influx right, in the beginning right. to be a huge, big scale distro brewery. So, um, yeah, the law change is kind of what, you know, gave us the idea to start yeah. this. So, And that's why we left Monday night in, in the first place is because we wanted to spend more time, sure. um, you know, building up our business plan and everything for this. Yeah, so we yeah. Essentially, went and split a job at Variant, and we again we no, interviewed step brother situation. We interviewed together, and we we're like, "Hey, we're, <laughs> we want to start a brewery. Can we split this job?" Yeah, they were looking for <laughs> like you know uh -huh. another brewer, and so yeah, that's basically what Josh said. We were like, "Hey, can we? Yeah, I'll work two days a week, one week. He'll work three, and vice versa." Yeah. So they didn't know who was coming. Yeah, like that day. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. but just but, one of uh, us would show up. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just work out your own schedule and make it <laughs> all happen. Exactly. Fun. But there's a, like a vacuum on brewery jobs, so yeah. I think it's yeah. if you're experienced, you can typically find one relatively yeah. easily. And of course, um, if you're good and come from a, a nicely yeah. pedigreed brewery where mm -hmm. you've you know what you're doing and you've got a great track rec record that they can that this, this new brewery can look back on. I mean, you're right. You know that that's your resume. They can taste your resume right there. Yeah, yeah. and they know you've been trained. You know by good folks and you know what you're doing. So yeah, yeah. Sure. So you wanted to start this brewery. And you both split a job mm -hmm. in order to <laughs> share time yeah. planning for this. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, we have very patient partners mm -hmm. um you know our uh significant others yeah. supported us while we split a job and got this going but um but yeah variant was great for us because it's you know seven barrel brew house yeah you know most most everything's across the bar direct to consumer right um not a big distro place so it gave us a good opportunity to kind of look at the model that we wanted to create sure. um and you know figure out how to, you know, do something similar to that, you know, yeah. cause our only experience was working on a 30 barrel brew house, 120 barrel fermenters. Right, like right. the scale is so much more massive than what right. we have here. So, um, you know, and in addition to that, it gave us a good look on, you know, what beers were selling the best and what experience people are looking for and things like that. So, um, so that was great. That was so, so really helpful. So variant, in fact, are, are kind of like small, silent investors in this brewery, and giving, <laughs> giving you the, uh, the, the the market research. It, de yeah. it definitely helped a lot. Yeah, sure. they were great. I mean, they they yeah. told us yeah. like everything, and it, since we told them from the beginning, you were very were, transparent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were really helpful. Yeah, sure. So then, uh, at what point were you able to actually get Inner Voice off the ground? Man, it took a long time. Um, How many years were you in planning then? sharing a job man it, it took maybe it was, what like six was, or seven months for the business plan to come together yeah it was something like that and then you know we had to go out and find money 
and that took a while to yeah. find investors. Uh-huh. And then the biggest, one of the biggest things that was difficult was the um, just finding a location. Mm. That was something that I didn't anticipate to take so long, but real estate in Atlanta is crazy right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, there's so much new development going on and these developers want to get their, you know, return back on this new building that they've built as quickly as possible. So rent is just through the roof. Right. Right. Um, well, especially since we wanted walkability, you know, we wanted to be in a, mm-hmm. in a densely populated area Yeah, yeah. And when you don't have any track record for running a business, uh-huh. no one. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> takes you know, you, seriously, you tell these real you estate know? guys like, Oh yeah, we worked at Monday night and you know, we brewed these beers, blah, blah, blah. They don't care. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like, what, what's an IPA, yeah. you know? So, um, to, you know, terrible developers, man, <laughs> <laughs> craft breweries add so much value right. to well, developments these days. For Come sure. on. They, Come on. They do, but you know, uh, they were looking for places like, you know, three taverns or right, like another right. Monday night well, yeah, where they have a name, you know, proven yeah, concept. Exactly. Sure, yeah. so, sure. Um, that was, that was really difficult for us. Yeah. There were times yeah. where it's like, dude, are we ever going to be able to find, we want to do this small, funky artsy thing <laughs> that, yeah. uh, you know, it's going to not be the thing for everybody. Yeah, it's like, called that's inner gonna, what? That's going to fit really <laughs> well into your, you know, your development. Sure. Yeah. No, but we landed on our spot in mm-hmm. January of 2020, which was a perfect time to yeah, bingo. sign a long-term yeah. lease. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. oh man. <laughs> um, yeah, which it, it took us like a year and eight months yeah. to start. I right. mean, because even, you know, to get the offices to approve plans, like everyone was at home. We, you know, yeah, it was like in yeah. No, from like shut down. March until yeah. like May, we all thought we were like going to die pretty much, you know? So, you know, it took a while to really get all that sorted out to even start construction. So you got it started. You guys have been open just over a year. You, you know, you opened, uh, yeah, it was it like 14, 15 months ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 15 months. Uh, so you, you come up with the idea for Inner Voice and uh, how, you know, what what is, what's the, how'd you decide what you're going to brew and uh, how you're going to build a beer program for the brewery? Well, so when we were talking about like being at Variant, you know, we found out that styles that people drink are like hyper local. We thought when we opened up that double IPAs were going to sell on draft like hand over fist. And so when we opened up, we had all these like high ABV IPAs and no one was drinking them on tap. They were taking them to go. Right. They Mm -hmm. buy those in cans and Mm -hmm. then they drink other beers on tap. Yeah. But coming from the suburbs of Atlanta, that's like their number one seller is an 8% double IPA. Their second best seller is like a, another 8% double IPA. So we were in this mindset of in the burbs, they'll drink the big beers Yeah, Yeah. in the city. They won't, they won't. And there's probably a little bit of even local, like the brick store pub has educated people for a long time here. Mm -hmm. Traditional styles. Yeah. And so it's fun for us though. It's fun to brew the lighter stuff as well, but pretty much all, most of our package sales are double IPAs and mm-hmm. then all of our tap sales are lagers. Huh. And low ABV it's stuff. strange. Yeah. It's like flip flop, you know, yeah. it's uh, the double IPAs do not move on draft no. as well as we would thought. Um, but we don't have a problem selling them on yeah. in four packs, but yeah. it's, it's strange. But, but IPA became a kind of core tenant of this, you know, compared to halfway crooks or, you know, the lager focus and Belgian focus or three taverns with their initial, you know, Belgian focus. Like, you know, you guys like, we're going to make some IPAs. Well, yes. coming from Monday night and, you know, then going to variant, you know, that's what yeah. we had a lot of experience doing. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, well, how'd uh, you uh, then, you know, try to, you know, come up with, what that IPA focus was going to look like or what people could expect from you out of IPA pale ale, this hop forward, uh, beer. Yeah. I think we didn't want to create like a single flavor from our IPAs. Mm. Like, so we change around our malts and yeast constantly, you know, like you're drinking one of the thialized yeast from Omega Yes, and they're really cool. You know, like it's something that's actually the first time we've used their most recent uh, iteration of yeah. it, which is the Helio gazer. Um, and it's, it's really cool. You know, they throw out, they have like a little bit of sulfury, like during fermentation. So you're always like a little scared, like, right. Oh, is this mm-hmm. going to taste like rotten eggs? Um, <laughs> but then it turns into like this passion fruit bomb and they're, they're pretty incredible, but I, the malt character, I think, is what changes a lot yeah. in our um, IPAs. We try to make them as pale as possible, but we go through a different bunch of different malts that are very pale to try and achieve that. So you want to create this kind of uh, uh, canvas for exploration and attract customers that want to go along on that journey with you. 
and, uh, you know, take some risks and do some exploration. You know, are there, anyway, let's talk about some of the consistence that can, you know, uh, things that, that fall through that. We'll talk about, you know, what through lines there are, what through lines are not, what those variables are that you kind of shift around in that pale ale space. But before we do that, is your brewery struggling to source or afford berry ingredients? Historic heat waves devastated U.S. berry crops, causing supply to dwindle and prices to skyrocket. That's why brewers are switching over to Old Orchard's craft concentrate blends, which mimic straight concentrates, but at a better price point and with a more reliable supply. Is it any surprise that Old Orchard's best sellers are raspberry and blackberry flavors? Reclaim your margins and order your craft concentrates at oldorchard.com slash brewer. Also, packaging beer can be a daunting task, but buying cans shouldn't be. American Canning provides packaging supplies at competitive prices and order quantities catered to craft. Think single truckloads and half-height pallets rather than million can minimums for a smooth packaging experience. Also consider their ultra-compact single operator canning machines. Pricing begins at $25,000 with a quick six to eight week lead time on most equipment. American Canning exists to help share your craft in cans. Learn more about their ecosystem of solutions at AmericanCanning.com. So let's talk about this. You've got, you, you then approach this from the idea of exploration and, uh, you know, making, building new flavors in this kind of hoppy beer space uh, and finding that sense of adventure in all of this. Uh, you know, what then becomes some of the consistent pieces to that? And what are, what are some of those variables that change? Or we want to talk, maybe we should just talk about, uh, you know, like a, a kind of a common base construction for, for a, you know, a hazy IPA, for example. Yeah, I, I think most of the time, like what's consistent is on the higher ABV stuff, we always make them extremely like densely hoppy. You know, we we put high density products into it from start to finish. Yeah, And we found that that uh, it's like really tasty, but it also aids in the longevity of its life cycle. Mm, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we'll have cans. Also imagine that with a small brew ha- seven barrel brew house here and a lot of seven barrel tanks that more concentrated hot products like that, you know, cryo and, mm-hmm. and, and whatnot um, will certainly improve yield. And, uh, you know, for sure. Yeah. It's a huge part of it. You know, we want to get the best yield without sacrificing any of that, you sure. know, sure. character, you yeah. know, so yeah. we've been using a lot of spectrum. Spe- um, yeah. like, I don't know. Have you heard of that product? Sure. Yeah, sure. So using like it cold on the cold side. side. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say a consistent Citra, you know, <laughs> yeah, citrus kind of the background of yeah. most of them. It, mm-hmm. Another thing too, since we're not, we haven't done hop selection yet. You know, we have to try and find, you know, the biggest lots of like what is good. Yeah, you know, yeah. We, we, there's sometimes where we'll get like smoky hops and we'll get you know stuff like that, and you know, you'll buy two cases and two cases of it to us is a lot. You know, so we'll have to like chuck it down the trash can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you, know? you got to use the the slice strategy. Um, you know, Zach from Slice was telling me that uh, he'll do collabs, and if he if they get he rubs a, a lot that they really like, like he'll just go reach out to the hop broker and see, hey, can Ooh. I get some of that lot? Okay, you know, good it's idea. a great way to like yeah. you know, yeah. Um, now of course you have to do some collabs in order to do yeah, that, I know. but uh, <clears throat> but anyway, you know, right? Finding those things, and once you find them, and you find something you like, try to buy as much of that as you possibly mm, yeah. can. Yeah. Um, you know, without selecting, you can still kind of find your direction and have some idea about what stuff is before, uh, before you commit in an even bigger way. Yeah. To yeah. And that's, that's definitely the future selection. You know, we want to, we want to try yeah. and, and, and get the most consistency out of all of our beers sure. right now. It's not really the case, you know, we're using the same hops, but you know, some of them are brighter or, you know, stinkier than others. You know, it kind of yeah. goes. Yeah. That's that been line. the most difficult part is, you know, we've had yeah. to, you know, just throw away, boxes of hops because we're like yeah. oh these are ass we're not right. gonna use any yeah. and we don't so. like we're not gonna sell them to people yeah you know? it's no, like yeah. i'm not gonna pass it forward <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah maybe on craigslist or yeah. something yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so when you, as you're building a, a recipe for a hazy ipa where do you tend to start uh it, it's typically just we keep them really simple from the malt side but it changes quite a bit you know like we were using extra or like extra pale wireman pilsner because we found that that was the palest yeah. that you possibly can have. And we have like a low efficiency system. So we have to pack, like pack a lot of grain in there, which yeah. adds color. So we were, that was something that was, you know, we were trying to accomplish from the beginning is just have these like really pale 
beautiful beers. That, right, right. Because you drink with your eyes, you know, when they're dark and malty, you, you think it's like a relic mm-hmm. of the past. Yeah. So we, we were experimenting a lot with that, and we used low-color Maris Otter, um, and then we were now trying the North Star Pills. North, 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 North Star, Star Pills. Pills. Hey. Yeah. Um, just to try to achieve that. And we have an uh, indirect fire system, which – also add some color too. Mm. So, um, but a carameliness, which is nice. Right. You just can't start, you know, if you had a Maris Otter beer, it would look like an amber ale. Yeah. 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 At the, when we first started, our burner was burning way too hot, uh, <laughs> unbeknownst to us. Yeah. And so we were just cooking the shit out of all these double <laughs> IPAs. And we we're like, oh no, we're, we're going to make IPAs. This is going to be our thing. <laughs> yeah. But we got it. We got it all sorted out. Yeah, we got dialed in. We do, we do. Sp- Still pick up some color from the yeah. from the kettle. So, so. Uh, but pills becomes now you know it, it's going to be some variation of that in order to get it as light as you possibly can. Yeah, and they all have different character though. You know, it's like the Wireman stuff has more of like a hay quality, and then like the Maris Otter has like a sweeter, nuttier quality, and then the pills, which we're we're trying for the first time here in the next week. Okay, uh, we'll you know we'll we'll update. You'll see yeah. how it goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, do you do you change your your uh, you know order for malt depending on what the ultimate beer is going to be, or yeah. what hops you might use? Yeah, in it? especially with like triple IPAs and stuff like that. We like we have to keep it like relatively simple or supplement a lot of oats because yeah. oats have low color as well. Um, but we we all of our malt bills are like really simple. It's like two grains typically. It's yeah. typically oats and it's... Oats and then pills malted. So, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. A little unmalted in there sometimes. Every once in a while, yeah, yeah. we'll throw feeling unmalted feeling wheat in there. Funky. Or torrified wheat yeah. every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. What for? Uh, different. Just yeah. to change it up. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, dude? Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. But then in on like our system too, we'll do it. Um, we don't really add very many hops at all. Uh, hot side. Yeah. You know, we... We don't add boil hops. We'll um, we'll chill our whirlpool to like 190, and then we'll yeah. add a, a little bit of incognito and a little bit of hops, like barely any. And really, what's barely any in a seven barrel batch? A, a pound of a pound of T90 and like uh, 750 grams of incognito. That is really really minimal. Yeah. In the whirlpool. Yeah. Why why dial that back that much? Oh, we've just found that like, you know, pe- the consumer doesn't like bitterness, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and the, the density from the incognito, it, it comes through. And yeah, then we also yeah. spectrum adds yeah. bitterness. Yeah. When you're, you know, um, charging the beers with big dry hops, you know, you don't really need a ton of bitterness from the kettle you because know? you get a lot yeah. from cold side. There's, I mean, there's some new research coming out around that, especially like measuring perceived bitterness through that. And I think it's all interesting to see where that goes. And you're right. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It is, there's, there is a lot of bitterness that is coming through that. Yeah. Um, but it yeah. seems like risky to not <laughs> well, <laughs> to, to yeah. do so little it, on the hot side. Well, well so like the only reason why we had T90 is so it like grabs onto the incognito mm-hmm. to kind of bring it into the beer. Hmm. Because we did do it once just like just incognito no. T ninety yeah the, in the whirlpool uh, yeah Exxon the whirlpool. Valdez at the top uh-huh. yeah it'll just ah, it'll oil. just the oil slick uh-huh. you know and we we want to try and like get it down into there huh. but um yeah the spectrum adds the bitterness that you would get that we at least get from the the whirlpool yeah mm-hmm. um and it depending on when you add the spectrum it it changes like the perceived bitterness mm-hmm. if you add it late yeah it, it can get really really bitter you know it's kind of like that hop burp. Right, uh, right. Burn, you know. So let's we'll talk about uh, cold side later on. I'm still curious about this you know, with incognito. Are there specific, uh, you know, incognito uh, varieties that you prefer using in the, in this whirlpool in this small kind of way? Yeah, most of the time, it is and, Citra. And, okay, um, but but we and use then is the T90 uh, Citra, and uh, it doesn't have spectrum. to be. You know, okay. so sometimes we'll we'll add um, like. We'll add El Dorado or yeah. Mosaic at that point in time. Whatever we have. It's kind yeah, of it's thing. it's really yeah. just like, you know, if it, if it goes along with the mall or the hot bill, yeah. like we want to keep it together. But, you know, yeah. El Dorado and Citra are pretty much the only ones we use. Yeah. yeah. But that's like really all that's available to us right now. Cool. <laughs> so why then use any at all in the Whirlpool if you're using that little? Uh, I, I think it does add mm-hmm. something. Yeah. You, you can tell... Uh, uh, like an un when you knock out yeah. after the difference 
because the incognito batch that we did, just incognito, mm-hmm. when when we knocked it out, you couldn't smell hops mm-hmm. in it, you know. But when when you add one pound, it grabs onto that seven hundred fifty grams of incognito and kind of brings it in. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Cool. So now let's talk about then the, that cold side. So uh, you know, you, you knock out. Um, what's the next rest of the process look like? What do you ferment with, and then uh, and then we can, you know, start talking about dry hopping. Um, and then we can talk about how you add yeah. the spectrum. Do you uh, do you add as you are filling a tank? Do you uh, you know you wait until you post fermentation to to add that and then no we you well we've done it like a bunch of different ways yes. yeah sure. we've, tried, sure. we've tried it all i think where we've landed at right uh, now is a, what like day two day or two three or three yeah yeah well when we ferment everything with london three you know i mean we're not gonna sure. try to rewrite the playbook on that um yeah. we, we use british five it's a little bit positive, too I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we did try british five yeah, yeah it, it it just dried out a little more and yeah at okay. least from our customers it's especially with how much we're dry hopping. You have yeah. to have that sweet that backbone. You're not going to go right. broke selling people sugar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. Uh-huh. That is yeah. absolutely the truth. Yeah, uh, you know, up to a point. Yeah, ours, every, ours yeah. aren't like yeah. ours aren't crazy, but you know, I mean, they, we, you just don't want to tip the scales. You know, yeah. you, where they tend to finish yeah. at in terms like of gravity. Like double IPA, like in the mid to high sixes. We have some that yeah. finish sweeter, um, yeah. but we we kind of target that like six and a half to seven maybe but sometimes they do finish sweeter and the, i will say the ones that do finish a little sweeter perform better um, <laughs> yeah, yeah always so you know i mean i one of our better ones recently a collab with variant would probably finish at what like, like eight, high seven no it was eight two eight two you know eight two yeah. play-doh which is it's a pretty lot sweet of sugar yeah. you know that's like probably where some of halfway crooks beers start yeah yeah you know? so um <laughs> But yeah, so we add the spectrum in. Um, yeah, but we, we just mix it off the tank. So we'll yeah. like sanitize the the sample port and we'll mix it in with with fermenting wort and just mm-hmm. pour it right on the top. Hmm. And then we'll wait until the beer is pretty much terminal to add a big dry hop charge. So yeah, we try not to have uh, nucleating tanks, although that yeah. happened to but me. But barely today. happened today. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> charge it to the game. It's uh-huh. another reason to use more spectrum, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with the spectrum, does it you know do you experience any like biotransformative uh, properties with that in there, or uh, you know is, is that why you're mm-hmm. waiting two three days for that, or um, you know do you just find that having some kind of convective motion from fermentation helps uh, you know aid in the general distribution of it? I would say both of those things. Yeah, for sure. It definitely adds a like it makes the. It more fruity. Yeah, um, it's like a good, it's a good, it can't carry the beer by any means, but it makes a really n- it nice base. It really, hmm. I think it accentuates the later dry hop even more, mm-hmm. you know? It, it um, does something to it, just saturation, you uh-huh. know, like this, like a lot of people will even comment, like our beers taste saturated because they're, we put a lot of uh, spectrum. Sure. As well. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, it's it's a different flavor. Mm-hmm. Some people might not like it, but any I'll, way we can layer in more hop character without getting a fucking yeah. three and a half barrel yield on a right. You know, I mean, we it's it's what we're gonna do. So the spectrum is what we found the best way to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, we played around with cryo a lot, um, which you know I think is due. Uh, you know, we need to revisit. But spectrum, we get the best yield. Um, we layer in that hop character we're looking for. And so, yeah, it's been our yeah. process. Lately. And we would use cryo too. Like if you have a way to get, like some people do like spunding dry hopping, like dry hopping mid with like yeah. a, a ball valve. And if we did that, we would probably use cryo more often. Oh, yeah. But when you add it so late, it always has like a little bit more of that hop burn. Like a stringency, where, where, where like you would, smokiness. Yeah, sometimes. you need to let it, sit for like you know some people will need to let it sit for a month before it yeah. tastes right and also uh, our tanks were when we we're adding or spinning in, in a centrifuge and, uh-huh. you know, some other things and yeah. when we were yeah. adding you know cryo and during on day three or whatever we were blowing out the top yeah. you know i mean we were losing a ton yeah. of product just yeah. from you know the beer getting stirred up and, yeah. and blown off so um for sure so are there some uh, some blends you find using these modern hop products that uh, that work better than others? In, in like what way? You mean like uh, 
you know, combinations or, you know, given the kind of somewhat uniqueish character of Spectrum and what that does, uh, are there, you know, then as you, you know, there are certainly plenty of hops that you can't get in that format. Um, you know, if you wanted to use New Zealand hops and some other things, like you're going to have to, you're going to have to still use some, some T90 pellets, uh, you know, in this. And I imagine that again, to keep that kind of spirit of exploration going, even if you're using a base of that, you're still blending, you know, with other, other types of hops. Um, but you know, are there any that work better than others or things that you found where it's like, ah, you know, maybe yeah. the spectrum doesn't play as nice with uh, with that. Everything goes with citra. Everything goes. <laughs> it's, everything's got to have that, you know, citra baseline. Yeah. In it. You know, I mean, it's just it just it, it's like salt or pepper. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like that. Yeah. What are yeah. you gonna make a dish without any salt? You know, it's the same <laughs> way with a IPA. Like it's just, you know, those hops are like citra mosaic when it's good, or like yeah. your Simcoe, yeah. like. It's it once there's that kind of like that baseline that's through the beer, you it kind of gives you like a little bit more freedom to get wonky with you know the other stuff you put in there and like oh let's try yeah. this out, let's try this combo. That constant kind of you know what you know is going to be good, just it goes a long way, even if it's not very much. You know, even right. if we just put citrus spectrum in it, it's still going to have that kind of baseline of flavor where we can get kind of weird about trying, you know whatever combo or whatever new hop that we want to try out. So, yeah. yeah. And just the sheer amount, like too, you can put so much citra in a beer and it will, it like never turns the wrong way. Yeah. You know, sure, but, yeah. Sure. but you know, when we use different hops, like hops that are like a little more uh, risky, you know, we'll, we'll do a smaller batch that will add like, or a smaller dose that will just add like a little bit of background noise. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but it's like the glue. It's just uh-huh. the glue that holds it everything it together. Yeah. Got, we use more than just citra, but still, like you know, it's got to have just like the background. it's yeah, it's the background. It's the uh, the no. drummer. Yeah, we like uh, we like Nelson too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We use a lot of New Zealand hops. I knew yeah. I, I knew I liked you guys. Yeah. Oh, oh man, yeah. it's like New Zealand hops are definitely my favorite. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, you know, if you're if you're thinking about it, what is the sensory for of citrus spectrum versus? Uh, citra pellet that you uh you know that you've also used in the past in brewing because you mentioned it's a little bit different i'm just curious i, I think what it's that more it's is. different in mouthfeel mm-hmm. more so yeah. than actual character huh. it gives the an oiliness for, yeah it, it gives an oiliness oiliness but yeah. it doesn't have that kind of it's know, not orangey is it orangey as like what regular um citra would be at yeah. least the citra that we want to get typically has like yeah. a lot of that orange zest mm-hmm. quality but it, it it's its own thing, you sure, know. It's, sure. it, it, yeah. but it's really nice. Haas sponsor us on this. <laughs> <laughs> Send us your stuff. <laughs> on that note, uh, let's uh, you know. Let's also let's. I mean, I want to talk about where you take it from there, especially as you start blending some of these different hops uh, from you know from different uh, localities together. Before we do that, ABS Commercial is a full service brewery outfitter, proud to offer brew houses, tanks, and small parts. To brewers across the country, they stock equipment ranging from three barrels to 90 barrels and offer custom designed equipment up to 900 barrels. Contact one of their brewery consultants today at sales at abs commercial.com. Just discuss your brewery project. ABS Commercial, we are brewers. Also, ready to get into canning but not sure where to start? Twin Monkeys Beverage Systems has helped hundreds of breweries around the world tailor packaging solutions that meet the unique needs of each brewery. Pioneering many new technologies like integrated liquid nitrogen dosing, expandable canning machines, and automated fill tuning, Twin Monkeys continues to push the boundaries of what is possible and what is necessary. See their lineup at www.twinmonkeys.net. I love the Haas buildings in Yakima and I love that like they've got the, like the giant sign on the outside of the building. Like this is our, you know, our, our uh, extract, you know, processing mm-hmm. plant. Like you can just like look and it's like, oh, that's the building that I need to go yeah. to. That's the innovation center. That's where they're pelt. Like, you know, Big it's flex. all very easy to, to understand, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 They have a product called Flex too. Oh yeah. No, is that? Yeah. Okay. I think so. I don't know. Whatever. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So as you're as you're now you know building uh, some some more broad hop blends, talk to me about how you you know your creative process behind that. Obviously, you're going to use some citrus spectrum as kind of this core <laughs> backbone of that, but then you're going to play on top of that. How do you you know how do you think about that creatively and what you're going to use, how you're going to use it, and uh, and what kind of blends you're going to build with them? I I think we prefer our IPAs to be more succinct and 
the flavor profile. We don't, I don't think we've ever used more than, we rarely use more than three hops. Well, well when we do, we don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't know. I, and I, speaking personally, I like it, you know, maybe this is from being a, um, a brewer. I like it when I can kind of taste an IPA and, get an essence of like, yeah. oh, that like talk like that talks Simcoe or that's like Nelson. You know, you can kind of pick out those right, different right. flavors that those hops lend. Um but yeah, I mean we don't really use more we've done a couple beers that have you know four different varietals in the dry hop, but I don't think we've ever done more than that. Yeah, right? They kind of get muddled, you know, yeah. when when you get that high. At least yeah. in our opinion. Most of the time we just put two like Yeah. It's like mostly may, most time two. Or or maybe it will be like two with citrus spectrum or yeah. two with something, you know, something else. But for the most part, it's, we're not trying to cram a bunch of different ones in there. Right. Right. Yeah. And unlike, you know, you're not trying to create consistency necessarily either where, no. you know, if you had a bigger brand and need that needed to be a consistent thing, you'd want to have more variables in there so that any one changing variable, you know, would be less noticeable where instead you're actually trying to find, the unique character each time for one of those. So it feels something like something new and something fresh and different for people without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, we've only rebrewed the same double IPA like three times yeah. maybe. I mean, cause you know, in our business, you've got to stay coming out with new shit and, you know, put new stuff in front of people's faces. And yeah, so, yeah. you know, we, we rarely need to replicate, I mean, you know, aside from like, memory farm IPA and a few of our beers that are constant on, but we rarely have the need to replicate hmm. a, a beer. Like, yeah. You but know? we still, even on the, even on our core, we try to make it better, you know? Yeah. So if it's right, you know, it's not like we're just going to be like, it's perfect just the way mm -hmm. it is. You know, if there's some things like over time that we're like, this can be improved, we're going to do it, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a great name. So we're going to keep memory. Right, farm right. IPA. Yeah. But it will always keep the same hops, but we might do like a, a different schedule just to try and make it yeah, better. You know, even mm -hmm. if we're not getting a good bat, you know, we've toned down the mosaic in it because oh, yeah. we were, we were yeah. not getting mo good mosaic. Mm. And, um, so yeah, you know, I think it's nice being our size and we can kind of like, you know, alter our products based on the quality of the ingredients that we're getting. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, we just so, want yeah. the beer to taste good, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're not gonna like stick to a script just because, right? Yeah. You know, right. We have to. Yeah. Um, talk to me about water, and obviously in these kind of hazy progressive styles, water is big, uh, a big piece of the equation. Um, you've got weirder water out here in Decatur, good quality water, but you know, water going out has its own issues. <laughs> um, you know, so, so the water generally in the greater Atlanta area is pretty soft and. Um, you know, and, and good water, you got watersheds, mounds, a lot of precipitation around here in reservoirs. And so you got surface water rather than a lot of aquifer or groundwater that's heavier in minerals. Um, you know, but, but what does the typical water regimen look like for these beers? Um, they're not probably as high on the chloride, you know, like content as a lot of people, you know, some people go like 300, PPM and yeah. stuff. We, we typically don't go over like 200 and we keep the sulfates relatively low, but we also add, um, we add sea salt to a lot, like most of our beers. Really? Yeah. Um, why? I don't know. It feels right. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> so that's, that's just sodium chloride, yeah, but yeah, with yeah, yeah, some yeah. other, yeah, other yeah. minerals attached to that. Yeah. I think, I think having sodium definitely amps up huh. the flavor of, of some of your beers. I wouldn't go super high, but you know, it's, it's something that we do. It sounds like a very mm. San Diego thing. Oh, yeah. Strangely enough. Really? Okay. Uh, I was just talking a couple weeks ago on the podcast to a uh, brewer from Sweetwater, and they're now brewing. They've acquired all of the Green Flash brands. That's right. And it's like, you know, the amount of just sodium in their water is humongous. Like, and so, you know, I think that's it's interesting that that is actually a, a West Coast, one of those more West Coast signature pieces that, uh, mm. you know, yeah. that, but it's also why... West Coast IPA in San Diego comes across, uh, you know, the way that it does. It, it hits so right. Anyway, you know, but there is that kind of, it does have that kind of, you know, twofold thing that, that mouth feel, that kind of like uh, heft that it gives to the water um, while also like adding a little bit of like a little cleaner sharpness mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it, if I remember correctly, so you're eating hazy IPAs, but with all of this salt that actually, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, it could add, you know, it can aid in bitterness, you know, having yeah. sodium, I think with the conjunction of 
uh, sulfates, but that's that's a memory in the past. I don't actually remember. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so when you're adding sodium even to some you know, like, yeah. or sea salt into this, how how much? Uh, what kind of concentration do you find? It's not super high. Yeah. If I, it's like uh, fifty or something, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's like uh, fifty ppm. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's it's low. Yeah, it's, you know, but it, but our water is like there's nothing in it. You know, yeah. it's like uh, there's a little bit of um, like hardness but i mean it's very minimal right like we're starting from essentially zero sure sure so we have to add enough calcium to it to like have yeast health and whatnot but. right let's talk about thiol yeast you guys have, have been playing around on this uh you love yeah. if you love new zealand hops like i do then clearly you love the flavors uh-huh. and the expressions uh, of thiols and and that you know that kind of uh nice fresh you know white floral or linen or like strangely almost like you know edge of brett kind of you yeah. know funk that some of these new zealand uh, hops and thiols can can produce um talk to me about your experience you know fermenting with uh you know with these thialized yeasts we've we've tried a couple of different things we haven't gotten into the whole um mash hopping thing yet yeah, no? I, think, I think we did it once but, okay. But we got one of the first batches of Phantasm. That was like a big thing for us, you know. Like I feel like we were the first uh, brewery in Atlanta to have a Phantasm yeah. beer. I annoyed the guy, the Phantasm, um, I forget his name. Uh, yeah, but, right. uh, Joss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I emailed him like a bunch. but um, yeah. You're the second brewer in two days that has told me that they had some of the first Phantasm in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, Who's we got a one? bone to pick with Who's somebody the out one? there. <laughs> I'm not telling. <laughs> Neil. <laughs> uh, we did a great podcast with Joss about Phantasm yeah. uh, earlier this year. And so if you want to learn more about how that whole process is there. But yes, it was, it was Neil was talking uh, Neil Engelman at, uh, at Three Taverns. It was also cool. doing the same kind of thing. Anyway, it's exciting, though, to want to, you know, play with new hot products and try, you know, obviously, if exploration is your jam, then, uh, you know, you want to, to be on that front edge. Um, you know, on the thiol piece, then, uh, you know, with, with these thialized yeasts, you know, talk to me about using those and, where, you know, how, how they've behaved for you and if you've discovered anything through the process of using them. Yeah, I would say, so we used the Cosmic Punch, like, kind of mm-hmm. right when we mm-hmm. opened it. We actually, we loved it, um, and we used it for, um, like, our first memory farm batch had that yeast. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just went in favor of something that made the beers a little sweeter, Um Mm-hmm. And it produced a lot of sulfur during fermentation. We were adding stuff. Like yeah. it, it made us like we couldn't repitch it as often because we felt like we were adding hops mid fermentation to get rid of sulfur. Mm-hmm. And, and who knows if that was even the right call? You know, we, we, don't, we don't really know. We just got scared of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we've just very recently done this, the most recent uh, heliogazer yeast that came out like a couple months ago. And we really like it. Yeah. You know, we, we did two beers with it. We did the one. That's a Belgian yeast origin, right? No, or am I thinking about this wrong? I think it's still it's the British like five. Oh, is it okay. British five. I think, I think they but just, they, they just amped packed it up more dials yeah. or whatever into it. I don't, mm. I don't fucking know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes good. Yeah. Um, no. So like during fermentation, it has like an undeniable mm-hmm. passion fruit guava quality okay. to it. And it's, it, and I, I hate when brewers say like, Oh, it's, you get all this passion fruit and guava. <laughs> um, but it was the only time that I've been like, that is undeniable. That's exactly mm-hmm. what that is. And um, it dissipates a little bit after you dry hop. And I, I've heard some, uh, like, some reasonings behind that. Someone was telling me about, like, heavy metals and uh, hops that pull it out of suspension. But I don't know the science behind it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, it, it definitely is still there, though. You know, We definitely it, had some conversations about that. I think it was Scott Janish at uh, Sapwood, yeah. uh, you know, who's been – yeah. Talking a little bit about that too. Yeah. But we still, it, it still comes through in the beer. I think you just, you had the Wanaka, right? Yeah. You know? yep. Yeah. I gave yeah. the Wanaka. And it, and it, it, it holds up. I think it, yeah. it stays in there better even than the Cosmic Punch from what mm-hmm. we found. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that one had uh, um, Helio Gazer, the uh, Motueka, and Nectaron in it. Ooh. Just kind of a new one. So, so hot right now. Nectaron, yeah, man. It's dope. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. 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 It's like kind of danky. Yeah. That's Rude. actually what I was dry hopping when the tank uh, yeah. just yeah. 
nucleated that's on That's an man. expensive mistake then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. How, you know, how do you think about, as you guys are articulating hop flavors and, and thinking about blends, even if it's happening, you know, just with one or two or well, one, be more than one, but two hops, you know, uh, how do you think about, uh, you know, quantities of each? And, you know, do you have a language that, you know, describes these things? Yeah, I, I think like for the most part, when you, when we are adding, well, we're cracking bags yeah. actively, like before we're dry hopping something, being like, "Is this what we want to put into this beer? Is right. this yeah. going to pair well?" We'll make an it? audible when we're, like, you yeah. Know, well, we've already really, cracked a bag, yeah. <laughs> you know. And and if it's done something that that's smelling good, we're not going to put it in a beer because it, you know, it's like a ten hour day to brew, and I don't yeah. want to, I don't want right. to rebrew a beer because we love dumping beers too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like right. it's like right. one of our favorite things yeah. to do. Every brewer's <laughs> favorite things to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. we do it like we've yeah. done it a lot <laughs> since we've really? been open. Yeah, because we don't want to put anything you know mm-hmm. that we're not happy with there, there's so many good breweries in the immediate area sure, here you sure. know it, we got to give people the best yeah. beer that we can give them you know and it's okay so. to make mistakes and we've made plenty of them yeah you know? it's like but we're just not going to serve it yeah and it's you know yeah but the um the nectar on like it, we've gotten two batches now and the first batch i think is was a little bit different than the second batch hmm. that we got and I like the second batch probably better, but it has a, it has like more of a, um, uh, like a stinky cannabis quality than the mm-hmm. first one did. Yeah. So that, that double IPA would just dry hop. We use Simcoe and Nectaron. Um, which originally I would have not thought it would have been like a really mm-hmm. good combo. Yeah. Me neither. But, but smelling them together, you're like, mm-hmm. I think that's going to work. How does that process work? Do you open both of them and like rub a little bit together just to see how the combined smell works or, not really. It's, yeah. it's, it's more just like w- what we have, we've, yeah. we've already cracked a bag of the Simcoe mm-hmm. and we've we, like, when we made that Wanaka, we cracked that new batch of mm-hmm. yeah. uh, nectar on and we're like, Hmm, I think this will work. That could work. Yeah. And you know, we're never, we rarely kind of go for like a yin and yang type situation. Mm-hmm. You know, we want hops that are going to kind of come together to kind of go after a similar flavor profile in the end, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, Simcoe with that kind of stinkiness that it sometimes has and with the nectar on with the kind of like danky cannabis, you know, it seems like it's a good combo. So they smell like relatively similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, in a weird way, like at least this batch, the first one was not. Yeah. Um, but so you're trying to find different shades of the, of a similar kind of, uh, you know, vein, in order to you know build a, yeah. a hop combo there, rather than trying to um, you know go clashy or contrast, I would say most of the time, you know, like that's kind of what I was saying earlier, where we yeah. we prefer them to be more succinct, if that makes sense, of like what general profile we're you know, attacking. Yeah, yeah, I love that word, and I use it all the time. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, that piece yeah. in your vocabulary. Yeah, it's one of my common descriptors. Uh, you know, if I find a beer that just you know that pulls it together like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, yeah. I hear it all the time. <laughs> from, from I've, I've heard it a couple of times already. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So you, when you bump up to double IPA strength, uh, what changes within the IPA program? I mean, obviously you're finishing gravity changes and they're going to be sweeter. Um, a lot. Well, so a lot of the time on the lower ABV stuff, we don't add spectrum. Mm. We yeah. just keep it because we want it to, uh, we want to keep the the yeast going, and we figure that adding a bunch of hops mid fermentation or like hop products might yeah. might do something to it. And that's happened before. Like one time, we used Spectrum on a regular IPA, and the yeast didn't perform super well afterwards. Mm, and yeah. we don't we don't do any of the yeast counts or anything. We're we're, we're tasting if it's sparkly going yeah. going yeah. by yeah. weight two point two pounds you know? per barrel, baby. Uh-huh. All right, <laughs> and it's and it's been working. You know, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it always works until it doesn't. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, and exactly. then we'll, and then we'll just dump then it. Then you dump the beer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're already there. You're already yeah, there. we've done that before. We have a microscope. It's just yeah, yeah. it's a lot yeah. of time. Sure, you know? sure. So, so you don't use spectrum there, you know, because that would have to be added while fermentation is still yeah. active. Um, then even these hazy IPAs, are you doing then most of the, you, know, you try to do hop pellets after, or I guess in the hazy pale, you try to, it would make sense to use that hazy pale ale as a yeast generator for, for larger beers yeah. purposely. Um, then I, so I assume then that you're going to finish fermentation, pull yeast off and then dry hop that beer. Yeah. 
for sure. Yeah. But then your double IPA is kind of the terminal and, beer for the road. Yeah, that's so the end of the road. Anything goes. You can load mm-hmm. all the crap yeah. in you want to. We yeah, we drop yeast before we basically let beers get we, they go terminal, you know. Yeah. And then we we drop the yeast, we dry hop, we shut it up, and then we try and dump it or dump the hops off the beer like Pretty quickly. We will know? dump the entire beer every once in a while, but yeah. we try not to do that. We, we try not but to dump yeah. the beer, but we dump the hops off the beer. We don't like to have a yeah. lot of hop contact time. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, why not? I, I just feel like it gets it becomes more vegetal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when, when you let it sit in there, and especially since we're putting so much in there, we just kind of want to get it in there, mm-hmm. mixed up, dump what we can, and then get it into a different tank. Can mm-hmm. we lower temperature at all for dry hopping or... No. No. no, no, we ferment things pretty cold already. Yeah. Cool on the cooler side, yeah, yeah. like we're I mean, uh, like, well, like uh, 66, 66, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, um, because we've had a couple batches where we've we've kind of pushed to see how many like esters we can get into some beers, and then London Three gets banana banana y yeah. and, yeah. and weird when you get up that high, and then it, it stays kind of peachy the lower temperatures, in my opinion. Huh. Yeah, it doesn't get that weird. Like banana laffy taffy quality, right. um, but yeah, and then we do a, a pretty uh, a long diacetyl rest on things. Mm-hmm. We let it, we let it like do its thing, get mm-hmm. to terminal, and then that's when we get drop it and put the hops in. Yeah, we don't really do any bio transform no you know, transformative hops. No, besides mm. the spectrum, right? Yeah, maybe we'll reapproach that, but. Yeah, I don't. Well, after today, I'm a little scared. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> what uh, What's one of the more exciting, uh, you know, things that you've discovered in making these, you know, hazy uh, IPAs and pale ales uh, or double IPAs over the last, you know, year? One of the things that uh, you know, is there anything in particular that just got you super jazzed to the point where you're like, oh man, I'm, uh, you know, I'm so thrilled with the way this has worked out. I think I think it's just figuring out the process and what makes beers taste the way that we want them to you know yeah. we, we, we want them to just be like so densely saturated with hops especially the big stuff mm-hmm. um and just finding that balance of the sweetness with your hop quantities added you know because mm-hmm. when they're really sweet you, we haven't like really found a limit you know we'll go you know five six pounds seven mm-hmm. pounds mm-hmm. yeah of a dry hop you know um, it's so you just, can't push like once they're that sweet, you you've got a lot more room right. and ladder you know, like space with bitterness, yeah, or even perceived bitterness right, in that yeah. dry hop where you're not going to overload it and people aren't going to feel like it's too bitter because there's so much sweetness in there. Yeah, and it, and like even the density to me, like again, this is like an anecdote, but I feel yeah. like it it holds the flavor in the beer because it doesn't want to break out as easy as hmm. as other beers, you know. So like even when you're when you're pouring on tap it takes a long time for breakout because it's, you know, because yeah. the liquid itself so, it's is so, just so dense, dense with, yeah. with hot boils. Yeah. So I feel like it holds it in more huh. when they're sweeter. Interesting. Yeah. It's been good to get towards closer to dialing in the amounts of every, you know, cause I think something that a lot of other breweries do where, you know, we've had customers come in and like, people always want to share beer with us. It's, it's fantastic that people do it, but you know, they're like, Oh yeah, I've been sitting on this IPA for a month and a half. It's drinking perfect now. You know, it's like we, we <laughs> like what or you know, it, it doesn't it kind of doesn't make sense. So it's kind of yeah. like we're walking that line and discovering like how we can make a hop saturated flavorful double IPA with a ton of hop character that you don't need to wait, you know, a month until it's, you know, drinkable. Right. Um, yeah, because some of ours, we would we would seriously let them sit in the tank for so long. Because they weren't drinking right, they were. We had to like mm-hmm. let them cool out. Sure, sure. Um, but now, since since we've kind of like dialed in the amount of hops and the amount of like residual sweetness, it's really like allowed us to release IPAs quickly. You know, like seventeen to twenty one days. Mm. You yeah. Know? Um, which originally, when we first started, they were like 40, 40 days. You know, <laughs> yeah. right, forty five yeah. right, days. Right. It was. We would legitimately just let them sit in there. Yeah. Um, and chill out. Yeah. Sure, sure. It seems like a you know a problem that everyone was was you know has been trying to solve, and again you know some of those s- problems get solved through centrifuges, which seem to do a great mm-hmm. job of taking out some of those harsher polyphenols that seem to be causing some of the you know that burny right. you know kind yeah. of herbal 
yeah, heat, um, you know, the, and the sharpness from hops. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you are letting Haas and their spectrum process just burn that off for you so that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's working, dude. I don't know. I yeah. Mean, you know. Yeah. So this is all a ploy to get some free spectrum. Oh man, man. <laughs> I've been I've been played on this one. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, you know, are there any other uh, areas of uh, experimentation that you're really excited about right now? Well, we something we're trying to dial in is our barrel barrel program. Uh-huh. Um, we we just got a bunch of uh, barrels in today. Matter of fact, from Pritchard's Distillery, and we got chocolate bourbon barrel and rum barrel and you know some different whatever barrels i don't i don't even know what all we fucking got but (laughs) um but yeah you know i think that's like another chapter that we need to add to our our playbook is kind of working on the stout game and kind of getting that dialed in so sure um, you know, because they're, they're really fun to brew. They're like, it's fun to try and make something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess um, maybe not. <laughs> we're here forever. <laughs> yeah. There's this other brewery here uh-huh. in Decatur that makes some big, thick barrel. Oh, there's uh-huh. a couple, dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no. Anyway, that's a subject. What do you, what is the ultimate goal for, for Inner Voice? What do you hope to achieve here? What's, uh, what's success look like? Obviously you're, you're still fresh and new and, you know, in this uh, brewery game. Um, but where do you, where do you hope to be in a few years? And, uh, you know, what's the ultimate vision? Man, you know, I don't think <laughs> you're just happy to be open right yeah, now, man. You know, I, I think for Josh and I, we're not trying to take over the world or anything, dude. Yeah. We just want to make a place that can support us and our families and give us a good life and have a place that people enjoy to yeah. come to, you know, that yeah. like people cherish and they bring their friends here when they have friends in town and they bring their families here and, you know, I, I think we do want, to, we're ambitious and we want to grow and, you know, we would love to have multiple locations one day, but you know, I don't see us ever buying a 30 barrel brew house and no. do anything like that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. What, what, what would you, what do well, you say? I mean, there's, there's so much of a headache for us to like think about sending a lot of beers out into the market. You know, we just, we started this place because we wanted to know how our beer was tasting, you know, mm-hmm. and also just create an environment that would be fun to hang out in right. and not be like the typical warehouse feel that Atlanta breweries were in the past. And, but now like when with smaller ones, you can like highly decorate your places and make them feel, have a bar like atmosphere, atmosphere and be, you know, comfortable. Yeah. And, but we hang out here like all the time, you know, it's like everyone. Yeah. We like like, being here. Yeah. Yeah. We like being here. And like, like on the, on like tonight, well, you know, we might be here till maybe not closing, but yeah, we'll we'll be here a little little later. Yeah. Well, it's good to, to like the place and the space that you've built and love to drink your own beer. Yeah. 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 It's It's in the community around us too. You know, it's it's been great. Made a bunch of friends. Yeah. You know, Uh so, well, it sounds like you've got uh, a great plan and uh, <laughs> you can figure the rest out as yeah, you go along. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great place to bring this to a close because I know fairly soon uh, the glycol chiller is going to kick back <laughs> on and we're going to hear some uh-huh. solenoids going off. <laughs> yeah. We're going to finish this just in time. Speaking of glycol, for nearly 30 years, GD Chillers has set the mark for quality equipment you can rely on. NA is no problem with the Alchemator from Pro Brew. Old Orchard's Craft Concentrate Blends mimic straight concentrates but at a better price point. American Canning provides packaging supplies at competitive prices and order quantities catered to craft. ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery outfitter, proud to offer brew houses, tanks, and small parts to brewers across the country. And Twin Monkeys Beverage Systems has helped hundreds of breweries around the world tailor packaging solutions that meet their unique needs. Of course, we would appreciate you subscribing to Craft Beer and Brewing. Go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, let us know that this content matters, and uh, tell us how much you appreciate these podcasts each and every week. Um, you know, I think we're going to kick something off here, and that is a all-access uh, recipe to go along with this podcast. And so, uh, uh, Rhett and Josh are going to share a recipe for a hazy IPA um, that we will push out in a couple weeks. Uh, you know, within a couple weeks of when this podcast airs to our all-access subscribers, um, and trying to give you some extra interest and uh you know uh, that little recipe piece to go along with it um just just for all access subscribers so go to beerandbrewing.com click on that subscribe button subscribe to the all access tier and come on you can even have a, a recipe for one of inner voices hazy ipas um 
people want to learn more about Intervoice, where do they learn? Where do they go find more about you, uh, both in real life and out there on IG, the interwebs? IG, baby. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. Uh, at Intervoice Brewing. Um, our website's in flux a little bit right now, but you can find <laughs> us uh, intervoicebrewing.beer. So check out our website in like six weeks. Yeah, wait six weeks. Um, but yeah, our IG is a good spot to find us. Um, so yeah, check us out. Cool. Well, Rat and Josh, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Cheers. dude. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.